What a wild season of Drag Race. The most amount of queens we've ever seen on a season, the shortest episodes that we've gotten in years, constant controversies online about the queens, the drama, the network, the gays of WeHo. I feel like this season aged me about five years. And as we enter a new era of Drag Race, the MTV era, we're left with a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts, and a lot of riggery. And maybe that's where the show does its best. I have so many thoughts on the season like as a whole, but I'm going to try and save most of those for a review video coming next week. So we are just going to try and focus on the storytelling and the riggery today. I guess I kind of lied earlier. I don't think this season has a ton of riggery. I think there's definitely some, but I mean, after seasons 11 through 14, I feel like this is kind of the least rigged season since season 10, but there's still plenty to discuss and talk about for this video don't you worry. Before we start digging into the riggery itself, let's set up the season. Let's talk about the cast. 16 queens. This season really felt like a major course correct from season 14, a season which I adore, but a lot of the fandom hated and have a lot of negative opinions to say about it to this day. The biggest complaints from season 14 were that there were just too many twists and too many non-elimination episodes. So for season 15, they decided to fix these issues, almost too much if you ask me. By upping the amount of queens from 14 to 16, that ensures that there will have to be eliminations almost every single episode. Because Viacom orders a certain amount of episodes that they have to fill, it's not like they can just shorten the season. Adding more queens is kind of the only option if they want there to be eliminations every week. And then they 86 the twists all together. This felt like one of the least chaotic seasons of Drag Race ever. It was a very like back to basics type season. When it comes to the queens that they cast, three of them stood out right off the bat. Sugar, Spice, and Everything Nice, aka Sasha Colby. I was shocked to see all of these queens on the cast when it was announced, but for very different reasons. Sasha Colby, let's just be real, is kind of too big for the show. Like, you could have Sasha on the judges panel, and that would have felt just as correct as her being a contestant. That's not to say I didn't think it was fair to have her on, or I didn't like seeing her on the show. It was just surprising to see such a well-established queen as a contestant. Then you have almost the complete opposite end of the spectrum with Sugar and Spice, who have almost no performing experience at all, but have huge names due to social media. I mean, I've been watching their TikToks for like years, but I never would have thought that they would go on Drag Race either. But in both of these cases, it's genius casting and pleases both the younger fans who now get to see some of the most famous social media queens on the show and older drag fans too who get to see one of the all-time greats get a shot at the crown. As for other noteworthy queens on the season, Lux Noir London has definitely been a pretty popular social media queen for a while now as well. I mean, I knew about her from Twitter way before I knew she was cast. Mistress Isabel Brooks is also a great casting choice not just because of her drag house, which is legendary, but for her being from Houston, which is known for its iconic drag artists and scene. Then you have all of the Connecticut queens, which is like still wild to me that they don't cast a single Connecticut queen for 14 seasons, and then they cast three currently performing in Connecticut, and another who is from Connecticut on one season alone. I wish this storyline, you know, like went somewhere, but stuff had to be cut for those 40 minutes, so whatever. I did appreciate that we got a pretty vast display of talent on this season when it comes to where everybody is from. Even if Connecticut is the new New York, we still had eight states represented, which feels better than some of the more recent seasons where, like, everyone is basically from New York or California. So let's start breaking down the season and getting into all of the riggery, starting with the double premiere, episodes one and two, The Variety Show. I loved how they formatted this premiere. We get the like split premiere vibes where we get to spend a lot of time with both groups and obviously we get to know them better that way. And then they get to come together at the end of the first episode. I think this is how they should do premieres from now on, especially if we're going to be keeping it at 16 Queens. We had one of the very few mini challenges of the season with the photo shoots that recreated the season one and season two photo shoots, which was so fun. Irene and Lucy won those photo shoots and 
Uh, it's just, it's sad to talk about Irene and everything that could have been with her if she had lasted longer. I mean, literally, if you just make this episode a non-elimination top two, then Irene survives and she probably makes it to like the end of the season. But that's a video for another day. I like that we got the variety show first again. I just wish we got more talents that were a bit original. <laughs> I mean, we got a lot of lip syncing to original songs. Or in Lucy's case, she sang live. We had six girls lip sync to their original songs and five more lip sync to songs that weren't theirs. Now, obviously you have queens like Anitra and Marsha and Sasha who did more unique things with their lip sync performances, but it just felt like a lot. It made the girls like Poppy and Jax and Anitra stand out for doing new things we haven't seen before. Overall, I think this episode was judged very fairly. I mean, I remember watching this episode with my mom and my sister whenever I go visit home for like a weekend. It's a drag race season. We always watch it together. So, you know, we, we discussed who we thought was going to be in the top, who we thought was going to be in the bottom. And we got literally every single one of the placements right, which was surprising. But like I always say, there usually isn't a ton of rigory in the first episode or two since they want to see which queens initially rise to the top or flop. And this season was no different. Jax and Marsha gave iconic performances, but Anitra's talent ended up being the top moment of the entire season, to be honest. So her win here makes total sense. And then for the bottoms, Lucy LaDuca definitely needed to let loose a little more with her moves while she sang, but I also think the editors did her no favors with that sound mixing. Oof. <laughs> Unfortunately, Amethyst and Irene made the same mistake with their talents. Both of these work great as numbers in a club, but on its own, on the main stage of Drag Race, they just do not translate very well. I mean, Irene has said, or I think Diabetes said, that Irene's number when she saw her do it live was like a six or seven minute number, and she has to kind of shorten that down to a minute 30 or, or whatever, is not always going to translate the best. They are the first bottom two of the season, and they lip sync to Seven Rings by Miss Girly Pop Queen Bitch Icon Superstar Mother Ariana Grande. I was hoping we would get to see, like, Bloodline or God is a Woman be the lip sync song instead, but sure, Amethyst outperforms Irene, and unfortunately, we see Irene go home first, which was the first massive hit against the season. Think about how iconic it would have been for Irene and Mistress to just troll the girls all season. Maybe we get more of her rivalry with Lux. Maybe we get to see her grow closer with Sugar and Spice like Mistress did. Irene did so much and had so many storylines already set up for her in this double premiere that I'm seriously like, just rig it for her producers. Like, you rig shit all the time. You can't rig this one thing for us that's going to make this season 50 times better. It's literally Derek Barry all over again. I hope we get Irene soon back on her television screens. Give her the Shangela or the Vanjie moment. And just bring her right back for season 16, honestly. I think we would all be okay with that. We move on to episode two, which is the commercial challenge. This time, the theme is a drag queen's version of Heaven which was a funny concept that I don't think these queens knew what to do with. This was the first 40-minute episode of the season, and I think in this episode in particular, it really falters because of that kind of limited time. They just had so much to squeeze in to such a short period of time, and it showed. I mean, this episode focuses on Sugar and how her group doesn't really want to hear any of her ideas. Beyonce, like, I'm just gonna do this for my own sanity. Let me, let me go I'm to gonna the move end. you let down to the, to the end. end. If you go. keep shoving your two cents yeah. in, I think <laughs> I'm gonna go insane. Yeah. And mostly everyone else just gets completely ignored. But for the twins being there together for such a short time, I thought the show actually does a really great job at fleshing out their arc to the detriment of all the other queens there, but still. Sugar is set up as the backbone of the twins, the one who ensures everything goes smoothly and gets spiced through any hardships. So it's interesting to see Sugar's struggle here of not being able to stand up for herself, and now Spice has to help her get through that. The twins are so interesting to me, and again, like, if they wanted to rig it to keep this storyline going longer, to keep them both around, they definitely could have, but they didn't. They do a good job of kind of setting up Spice for a longer story arc and finishing Sugars up here in episode three. 
It shows that they both have different strengths and weaknesses, and I think it does a good job of showing us a deeper look at them behind all of the canned bits. While Spice did way better than Sugar in the variety show, we actually see Sugar do a great job here in the commercials. They get split into three groups, and honestly, I think this episode should have just stayed judged in groups, because there was one team who did amazing, every single one of the queens on the team did so good, and then two groups who really struggled. But it's judged individually, which is like, whatever, why? Our top three is Sasha, Lucy, and Lux. I really think this episode wasn't judged in teams so that Lucy could be highlighted and start her redemption arc after narrowly missing the bottom two the last episode. She starts off this episode by saying that she doesn't think she deserved her low placement from episode two and is going to fight to show the judges why she deserves to be there. So it makes sense thematically for her to then get a top placement since she does do super well playing Dolly Parton in her commercial. But her entire group's commercial makes no sense, so it kind of feels off rewarding anybody from that team. I mentioned how Anitra's team did the best by far, and it was because they had a clear and concise idea. It wasn't anything crazy or convoluted, and each member of the team got a moment to shine. The queens only had about an hour to get their scripts together, and because the sensitive nature of the concept, which is like, you know, whenever you get religion and gay people in a room together, you know those media outlets are ready to go to, like, make a story out of it. So production told them that they had to scrap a lot of their ideas. So that explains why two teams really felt like they had weak concepts overall. Team Amethyst struggled because their concept was literally all over the place. It was like 30 ideas mashed up into one, where half the jokes didn't even land. Lucy was the one bright spot, but it's not like it saved the entire commercial. And then Team Leftovers, the queens who didn't get picked to be on either Team Anitra or on Team Amethyst, kind of fell in the middle for me. They have a clear and concise concept, which was like that straight annoying girl at the gay bar's idea of a drag queen heaven, but they just didn't ensure that every team member got a chance to shine. Mistress Robin and Jax basically just are window dressings in this skit. They do basically nothing the entire time except hang out in the background, and it's all sugar and Malaysia. The bottom two here does make sense. Poppy was the one who was behind a lot of the ideas and the jokes that didn't land for her team's commercial, and Amethyst had some cringy moments as well, and I mean she was team captain, so anything that goes wrong does kind of fall on her shoulders. Jax being low, I definitely understand. I don't think it's rigged. I thought that they really didn't do anything to stand out in the commercial at all. But I do think that the producers could have chosen Robin or Mistress too if they had wanted, since both of them fell victim to the same issues that Jax did. But Jax was definitely picked since she was set up as the villain of this episode. Jax both takes control of the planning process, which is painted to us in the edit as her being a little controlling, and also has the famous, like, pushing sugar, <laughs> launching sugar, smacking sugar, punching sugar in the left tit over to the end of the table as the fandom like to exaggerate it to be which you know it was definitely edited to be villainous i think we got the rattlesnake sound effect and all of that so her being in the bottom three this episode just narratively makes a lot of sense where robin had no story or any really moments at all this episode unless you're going to throw her in the bottom with amethyst there's no other story for her being in the bottom so Jax being that bottom three placement makes a lot of sense. Poppy and Amethyst lip sync to A No Mountain High Enough by Diana Ross. And while some people I think really enjoyed Poppy's comedy and campy approach to the song, it's definitely to me giving Cracker versus Cameron to Nasty Girl on season 10, where Cracker might have made better moments, but Cameron fit the vibe of the song better. And I think that's why Amethyst stays over Poppy, which I don't think was rigged. Poor Poppy fell victim to the second out curse where everyone remembers who's out first, but the second out always ends up being the more forgotten cast member of the season. But, you know, it seems like Poppy didn't love the filming experience and wouldn't want to go back to the show. And 
is more comfortable just doing drag in her little bubble that she's in. So good for Poppy for seeing that and doing what she wants to do with her career. We move on to episode four, which was the Snatch Game. I bet the producers were literally kicking themselves for putting it so early in the season when there was 14 queens left after they got that 40-minute edit. I mean, if you think about it, the Snatch Game in, on another season with only 14 queens, this would have been episode one, which is crazy. There's basically no content besides the challenge and the critiques in this episode because of, you know, how long the Snatch Game goes and it takes up so much time. But like how last episode was all about Sugar, this one is all about Lucy. We hear her say that she's glad she was in the top last week, but now she wants a win. And we hear her talk about her backstory, and then it's not shocking when she wins the challenge, kind of finishing out this four-episode story arc that she's been getting. I go way more into Lucy's edit on the show in the video I just put out last week, so go check that out if you are interested. For the third episode in a row, I don't see any riggery, and that might be a record, and it had me clutching my pearls as I was watching, because I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do in this video? But luckily, the riggery starts up in literally the very next episode, so it's fine. A lot of people said Ora Mayari should have been in the bottom over one of Sugar or Spice, but like, be so for real, <laughs> please. Aura had one of the best runways of this episode, and Sugar and Spice had one of the cringiest Snatch Games ever. And they combusted together, so of course they would be in the bottom together. I'm actually shocked that they let the storyline fizzle out as soon as they did with Sugar and Spice, but you can't say it wasn't warranted and it wasn't fair. I don't know exactly what the plans that they had with them were, since like Spice revealed one of the potential lip sync songs on the season was We Are Family, which couldn't get any more on the nose. We know Drag Race loves to drag out a storyline, so it's just surprising to see them and this huge one so soon, especially with how much attention just the casting itself of these two twins got. But now that the twin storyline is over, it allowed for so many other queens to start to get some focus, except for Robin Fierce. None for Robin Fierce by. The only thing I wanted to highlight in this episode was Amethyst. What an amazing episode for her. After two bottom placements in a row, she could have easily come into this episode so defeated and just kind of gave up. But she managed to take a very tricky character to do in the Snatch Game, Tan Mom, which is more a meme than like a personality, and make it so funny. I actually thought she could have been high over Marsha, especially if the runways come into play. Amethyst was so good, and Marsha, I mean, this was my golden boot of the season, so. Amethyst seemed really primed and ready for Drag Race, just looking at her Instagram and her performance videos. I mean, the girl has so much music out and knows how to be a professional, but for some reason, things just don't really come together for Amethyst on the show. I think she is honestly a great All-Stars candidate for a future season, though. Just give her a few years to really learn from her mistakes on the show and get everything even more polished, and she would be a perfect, perfect person to put on an All-Stars. The twins are in the bottom, they lip sync to You Better Run, and it's, it's a very interesting lip sync, we'll just say that. A lot of people said this could have been a double stay, a double sachet, sugar should have stayed. There's lots of thoughts. But at the end of the day, the story that the show was setting up was that sugar was the one who kept them together. And without her, Spice has to find out how to do that for herself. And it's a much better story arc than sugar staying over Spice. And I wish that that story arc went literally anywhere. Moving on to episode five, the design challenge, this is where the riggery starts to come in. You can picture me watching, like, gleam in my eye, like, oh, I have content for this video, finally. Something Drag Race does a lot is rig stuff in order to make sure every girl gets critiqued at least once in the first few episodes. And at this point, there were three queens who had yet to be in the top or the bottom and had just been safe. Malaysia, Robin, and Selena. And all three of them could have feasibly been safe yet again in this episode. But instead, they all get critiqued, and we get an extra high spot added just to make that happen. Looking at Robin and Malaysia specifically, they both are in the top, and 
I mean, <laughs> Malaysia is more towards the bottom for me personally, with Robin looking, I mean, stunning, but her look was just fine to me. The things I like most and like noticed first about her look were her hair and boots. So for a design challenge, that's not the best. Lux and Sasha are both rightfully in the top though, with Lux getting the win in one of the most iconic design looks we have ever seen. As for the bottoms, it's it's a mess. We have Jax, Amethyst, and Selena. Now, what I will say about the design challenge is that there were no disasters. Like, no one flopped hard. We didn't get, like, an iconic golden boot moment out of this. I think Amethyst was clearly the worst, but, like, in other design challenges on other seasons, like, this would have been safe as fuck. Jax and Selena being in the bottom three is just... It, it makes no sense to me. Is the fit not exactly perfect on their looks. Sure, but they put so much work in, the designs themselves of the looks are so fun and fresh and different, and they took risks, and for me, I thought they paid off and looked pretty damn good. For Selena's first critique of the season, I think they definitely wanted to highlight her fashion choices since she'd worn a few looks now that the audience, like, hated, and I'm not sure how the judges felt about them, but I can assume that they might have felt the same way. So putting her in the bottom here is kind of like a delayed response to that. But like I've said on the podcast many times, you either get Selena or you don't. And I get Selena, so I loved this. If you haven't listened to my podcast throughout the season, you've missed a lot of my commentary on Selena and her run on the show, her drag perspective, and how she was perceived by the audience and the judges. I think it's a very nuanced discussion, not really meant for like a fast paced video like this, but I have a lot of thoughts on Selena I still want to say, we'll save that for another video. Selena bodies Amethyst in the lip sync to Queen by the legend and icon Janelle Monet, and we move on to the girl groups challenge, which kind of like the 1960s themed one from last year, focuses on the girls playing characters, not just going out as themselves. And I love this, especially since we get the Rumix every season as well. It gives us a different flavor of the girl group challenge every year and just kind of shakes it up a bit. This episode has the iconic Metal Gate moment where Malaysia's storyline really picks up and she kind of becomes the main protagonist of the season for a few episodes. Most of the focus on this episode and the following episode follow Malaysia and Mistress as their friendship dissolves due to Metal Gate and their following argument, and then their rebuilding of their friendship after. This episode was judged so weirdly because there were a few approaches they could have taken that would have made so much more sense than what actually happens. They could have easily given the challenge win to Team Country. There's three teams in this episode, Team Country, Team Metal, and Team Hip Hop. They could have very easily just given the challenge win to Team Country. All of them get the win and we move on, kind of like they do with the UK girl groups, because like they were clearly the best group overall and it would have made total sense. Another option, pick the best from each group, which was Mistress Sasha and Lucy, and then put them in the top and then give the win to Sasha since she was very clearly the best in this entire episode. But no, they put Aura in the top and then give her the win for what I consider a very, very safe performance. And I hate saying that I don't think Aura deserves the win here because the fandom was so nasty to her all season long and only now is just starting to come around to her. But I have to be honest here, I, I don't think she won this challenge. She said that the story of her father's death she thought was going to be a big part of the season and her story arc. And I think in the initial edit, it was. I mean, why else do they make such a big deal out of Aura getting the win here? I also think she potentially could have been a bottom placement for the episode we just had. Like, I think she got a little bit of favoritism for sure. And it would have made more sense if she had a storyline to go with it. But she's barely in the episodes at all, unless she's saying something about her being like trade. So the favoritism just feels really random. I also think that Sasha had been doing super well with a win under her belt and multiple top placements, and we haven't even hit the midpoint of the season yet. So I think producers knew that they were on a very wobbly tightrope with Sasha Colby being on the season. 
and balancing her against all of these other queens was going to be very difficult. You don't want her to just dominate with win after win after win because then the competition feels flat and her win will just feel so obvious. People are going to lose interest. But you don't want to constantly rob her of wins and top placements either because then the fandom will accuse you of robbing one of the most iconic drag queens of our time, which also isn't a good look. I think that they toe the line okay, but not great. Like, I don't think Sasha necessarily deserves one of her wins later in the season, but she definitely deserved the win here, so just give her the win she deserves, and it all balances out. I am glad that Aura got a win here, since she deserves some recognition from the fandom, but due to it being seen as undeserving, it kind of backfired on her, and she ended up getting more hate, which was just so unfortunate. And then if we look at the bottom placements, it also showed some favoritism, this time for Anitra. And God, the Anitra fans, they scare me. There's always that one queen whose fans are just a little too much. And I'm sorry, Anitra fans, but that is you. Not all of you, but some of you. Even in the polls that I would put out throughout the season, Anitra would have like a rough week, a rough episode, a rough runway, <laughs> like this one, and everyone would vote for her to be safe or like, no, it was good. Like, no, it was fine. And it's like, oh, y'all like to call it my bias. Check yourselves. Check yourselves. Anitra was the worst of this week. Not only does she miss the entire point of the challenge, which is to be an old lady, but she misses her lyrics and has one of the worst runways of the entire season in this episode. Now, I love Anitra. Love her. But I'm going to be honest when she doesn't do a great job. And in this episode, she doesn't do a great job. Anitra had kind of disappeared on the season after her win in episode two because of the 40-minute runtime. She's not a part of any of the storylines going on, not Sugar and Spice, not Malaysia and Mistress. Plus, she'd been safe ever since her win, so it did become a little worrisome for her winning chances for sure when she's not anywhere on these episodes. This episode in particular, I knew Anitra would be fine after she was saved from the bottom, which I don't know why this wasn't pointed out in the critiques because I was waiting for it, but I think it was to kind of spare Anitra. Why was the hip-hop group splitting and dipping and flipping and launching like... <laughs> You're supposed to be old ladies. Like, Anitra and Robin were the worst offenders of this, and it just, like, took me out of the fantasy immediately. Like, the comedy is that you're old ladies in a hip-hop troupe. And when you're just doing all the moves that you would be doing as, like, a 25-year-old or, like, a 28-year-old, I don't know, I don't remember how old Anitra and Robin are, then it's just, it takes you out of the fantasy. It's completely shattered. Jax is put in the bottom because they hate Jax. <laughs> And it's the second episode in a row where I felt like she had a safe performance that was then put into the bottom to save the other girls that they liked more. Both times, in my opinion, Spice. But we'll get to that later. Jax really doesn't get much storyline on this season. We get to hear about her upbringing with her white foster parents in Connecticut, but we don't really even get to see what queens she's close to, what friendships she's formed. And I think a lot of the Connecticut queen stuff got cut for time which probably meant Jax got cut for time a lot. It's just so strange that she started off so strong in the talent show, and then producers immediately stopped giving a shit about her and use her as collateral damage to save other queens instead. Jax is perfectly fine in this challenge. She gives more old lady than Anitra and Robin do for sure, and despite having a pretty weak runway, I still think queens like Spice did worse than her overall. It's just sad to see her constantly be given the short straw on the season, and this continues in her last two episodes. And, you know, like talking about the theme of this girl group challenge, which was grannies, looking at Carrie Colby last season, who was sent home for having a pretty solid performance in the girl group challenge, it just didn't fit the vibe they were looking for. That's why I feel like Anitra really got a pass. But the queen I feel the absolute worst for at the end of the day is Robin Fierce. I mean, I don't think she gets robbed or anything. I just feel like the fact that she was on the season for six episodes and is barely seen at all 
not given any storyline besides a few mentions of her hookup with Amethyst that they tried to make something, but it was never anything to make. And then barely any confessionals, no backstory whatsoever. We never got to know Robin on the season, and I think she'll be known as the Purple Kelly of Drag Race, unfortunately. But she makes the critical error, like one of the biggest mistakes you could ever make on Drag Race, which is telling the judges that you are you are fine staying in your comfort zone and you don't really want to take risks. I mean, that's like the worst thing you could possibly say because this show is all about forcing queens out of their comfort zones, getting them to try new things, and then celebrating it when they succeed. So if you are saying, I'm not going to play ball, you're going to go home, which is what happened. But Robin Fierce is an icon. Go stream her new single, Bad Bitchery. It's genuinely such a bop. And I hope to see more fun things from Robin in the future. But Jax sends Robin home in what I think is the most underrated lip sync of the season to the absolute bop in my room. And we move on to episode 7, Daytona Wins to Electric Boogaloo. One of my favorite rigged recap episodes, my podcast of this season, is the episode I did with Runner Eye, one of my favorite Drag Race channels. Genuinely such a fun and kind soul. If you like unhinged content, he is your guy. And <laughs> you should listen to that podcast. I love that episode that we did. We are both totally obsessed over this challenge. And it was honestly a highlight of the season for me. I'm just going to say it. This should have been a double win between Malaysia and Mistress. It would have felt so correct for the storyline that they had going, for their performances in the challenge, and they both had very fun, amazing looks on the runway. So I really wish they just would have done that. And I actually think other than that, and I mean, it's not rigged that it wasn't a double win, it's just what I would have done. I actually think everything was pretty fair in this episode. But this is one of the episodes on the season where many queens have alluded to the edit of the challenge, leaving a lot of stuff out. Now, multiple queens have said that many of their lines and scenes had been cut for time, which makes sense. We're still in the 40-minute era. Jax, Mistress, and Lucy have all said this, and it makes sense because it seems like so many characters in the skit had, like, nothing to do. Sasha, Lux, Selena, Jax, like, what was the reason for their characters being there? It really was the Mistress and Malaysia show. And I said this almost every week on the podcast, but I wanted all season for Malaysia to bring it in the challenges like she brought it in the confessional. She really was the Carrie Colby of the season in that way. She has so much charisma. She has so much heart and is so much fun to listen to in the confessional. But then when the challenge comes up, basically until Daytona wins, she would just kind of shy away and not let herself shine not perform to the best of her ability. And it got to be so frustrating because I love her so much and I knew she had it in her to dominate. But then this episode, it was really good to see her finally bring it like I knew she could. It's funny because I do think Spice had gotten some favoritism in the last few episodes since Sugar left. I think that they wanted to see that storyline kind of form where Spice starts to really slay and is like, oh my gosh, I don't need my sister to like do a great job and like get myself together. I could do it all on my own, but <laughs> she it wasn't happening. So I think they were kind of waiting for that. And at this point, they were getting impatient. We see in the recording process of the skit that Spice was very much struggling with the lines and giving Rue what she needed from her, but also T from Roscoe's. Nobody knew their lines except for Mistress and Malaysia, and they were all reading from teleprompters because they had so little time to go over the scripts before they started filming. So there's that. But in the final product, I thought Spice was pretty solid. I mean, she didn't knock it out of the park or anything, but she did a good job with the small role that she was given, and I didn't think she stood out as being, like, bad or under par. And the critiques seemed more to focus on the recording process and not the final result, and more about her, like, repetitive runway walk. And, like, her repetitive... Ro and, like, her repetitive runway walk. I just had to record myself say that, like, ten times. <laughs> the tongue twister. Repetitive runway walk. 
But if the recording process mattered in the final critiques, then Lawrence Chaney would have been in the bottom for the Beastenders challenge, and Kylie Sonique Love would have been in the bottom for Rumerican Horror Story. So it just doesn't track. Spice was put in the low spot here to save Lux, in my eyes. Lux, I thought, was one of the girls who had a very, very small role, but she didn't do much to stand out otherwise. And especially because she was kind of in a dual performance with Sasha, she got outshined at every moment by her. And I think she had two lines. One of them was delivered pretty awkwardly in the final edit. There's something wrong, darling! So I think that they were like, okay, well, we've been saving Spice and throwing other girls into the bottom instead, but now we need to save Lux. So Spice is now the lowest on the totem pole, so you're going in the bottom. The bottom two, though, is Aura and Jax, which sucks because they feel like the two queens with the least amount of storyline and content left, but Jax definitely destroyed that sweetest pie lip sync, and how weird to give Aura a questionable win and then send her home the very next episode. Like, it wasn't like she was robbed or anything in this episode. Like, she deserved to be in the bottom and then lost the lip sync. But I really think my theory of her having a huge storyline that got cut is the only thing that makes any sense as to her weird trajectory here. Also, Aura had so many incredible looks that didn't make the final cut. So go check out her Instagram. Her aesthetic is everything to me. Next up is the Lala Perusa. And I love that they just made it a regular challenge this time instead of like a punishment. I think it worked great. This episode is really hard to judge. I mean, I've put out a few different polls at different times asking you guys who you thought won each lip sync and the results do not stay consistent whatsoever. So I'll do my best to say objective as we go and break them all down, and I'll also show the results of my most recent poll too as we go. They do the whole bingo ball way of like determining who goes when or who gets to pick who they lip sync against, and unlike last season, where we literally see the pick crew member look in as he picks out the balls, this time we don't see that but I'm not convinced they don't just fill that thing with the same name every time that they wheel it out. Because, I mean, how boring if the balls read, Sasha, you go first. Anitra, you're next. Jax, you're up next. And then suddenly, all of our best lip syncers picked the weakest and all move on to safety. And then we're just left with all the weaker lip syncers at the end. That doesn't make for a very compelling episode. It only makes sense to have the strongest lip syncs at the end as like we build up to this moment. That's why when people were like, oh, Jax got the Jasmine Kennedy treatment, I'm like, yeah, that's the only way this is gonna happen. They're not gonna leave the weakest lip syncers to be the last two, and then there's a flop lip sync to end this episode. Like how anticlimactic. In order for this challenge to work, there has to be strong lip syncers around at the end. And look who gets picked first, Malaysia and Lucy Laduca. And they're, I mean, no shade, they're two of the weaker lip syncers on this cast. So it just works so much better this way to get some of the more meh lip syncers out of the way first, on to safety, and let's just keep these strong ones here till the end. We also know that the first two lip syncs were the shortest edits that the queens had to learn. They don't hear the full songs on their iPods for these, they just get the edits of what they're going to perform to. They also only had a single day to learn all of these songs, which makes queens like Malaysia, Jax, and Spice, who miss some lyrics, more understandable. So Malaysia gets picked first and chooses Marsha. They lip sync to Boys Don't Cry, and come on, Marsha obviously won. Your poll results also reflect this. Moving on. Next is Lucy versus Spice to Do You Wanna Touch Me? I'm so happy this song made the cut as a lip sync song. I love this song. I've loved it since I was a kid. Now, your poll results show this being very close, with Lucy just barely inching ahead of Spice for the win. I actually think this is the weaker of the Spice lip syncs in this episode. I thought Lucy definitely won this one, even if she didn't, like, annihilate. I still think she did better than Spice, so this checks out too. Next up is Selena versus Lux to It's All Coming Back to Me Now. Selena obviously beats Lux in this one, and we move on to the closest of the night, in my opinion, Mistress versus Jax to tell it to my heart. I really think, depending on your taste in performance style, you can see a different winner because they both did fantastic 
in very different ways. They both took a completely different approach, and I think both work. Jax takes the more stunt-heavy but still dynamic approach, while Mistress goes for the old-school approach. I personally would give Jax the win, but I don't think it was rigged to say Mistress won since it was so close. But just the fact that they did choose Mistress over Jax shows who they cared about more, and from a production standpoint, who they wanted to be safe. Up next, we have the iconic Sasha versus Anitra to I'm in love with a monster. They both ate, but Sasha just has that extra something that makes her stand out as the winner. Anitra, I think, sometimes struggles to connect to the song that she's performing to with her face. She has so many awesome moves and tricks. She's an amazing dancer and performer, but watching her face, I feel like sometimes it's not telling the same story. While Sasha really connects to every single song she performs to. As we go into the second round, Malaysia gets picked again and chooses Spice. Again, kind of sus. Not because she got her name chosen twice, but because one of the weaker lip syncers got picked, ensuring the stronger ones definitely have to duke it out at the end. Malaysia takes on Spice to Don't Go Yet by Camila Cabello, and what a weird choice for a lip sync song. I don't think it worked very well. Neither of them know the words, and honestly... I feel like Rue should have just sent them both back in and be like, try again next round. Because I felt like neither one. Malaysia just maybe lost a little less, but even so, I liked Spice's performance better. I don't know. They could have saved Spice here if they wanted to, but Malaysia is saved and we move on to the three-way lip sync. I hate a three-way lip sync. I wish they had just waited to do this challenge until there were eight queens so it all worked out nicer. And then there doesn't have to be that dumb twist at the end either. Whatever. Lux versus Anitra versus Jax to the right stuff. Lux wins, which I thought was pretty clearly the right choice. But based off the votes here, you guys don't really agree. Again, I think Anitra just doesn't sell the song with her face as well as Lux does and give the same amount of fierceness that Lux does in owning the song. So I don't think that this is rigged. I'm sorry if you disagree. So now we have the bottom three, Spice, Anitra, and Jax. And for some reason, Anitra gets to choose someone to save. I hate this twist. I hate it. It's like the get out of jail free card. And you either look like you're taking the easy way out or you're taking a huge risk and being stupid. Neither choice is great and Anitra saves Spice probably because she can read the room and knows production doesn't give a shit about Jax, and if she gives them what they want, which is a great, fierce, iconic final lip sync between two powerhouse performers, she's probably going to be good regardless. And well, that happens. And this is where I, I do think this episode was staged from production standpoint on who gets to lip sync when and who gets picked for what, because Reality TV is not going to take chances. They're not going to take the chance that Spice's ball gets picked and she then has to save someone and go up against the other. And then it's just like, obviously we all know what's going to happen. Either Jax or Anitra are going to beat Spice and that's the end. Like, that's a very anticlimactic end to this episode. They're not going to risk that. I would bet all of my dollars, literally all of my dollars, that Anitra's name was on all of those balls. Because she also is the smartest of, the, not the smartest of the three, the smartest when it comes to making good television. She knows what they want, and she gave it to them, and she stays, and it's like, oh, perfect, amazing episode. That final lip sync was, you know, two of the best performers of the entire season. Isn't that interesting how two of the best performers of the entire season were still around in this final, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's rigory to me, honestly. Like, from a producer standpoint, I would do the same thing. I would never risk Sasha and Anitra and Jax all getting their balls pulled, one, two, three, they all are out, and then we have the weaker lip syncers left. Like, I would never do that, so I get why production also did what they did. Jax is sent home, and even if technically it's fair, I see why she lost all of her lip syncs. It still just feels wrong. Like, with Spice getting saved specifically, it feels like she was given yet another lifeline and Jax was thrown to the side yet again. 
I wish we had gotten more of Jax, not just because I think they're the hottest cast member out of drag, but because they have such a dynamic performing ability, a unique take on drag, and a very interesting background I wish we had more time to hear about. Also, one of my favorite lip syncers, if not my favorite lip syncer of this entire franchise, watching her performances on TikTok and on YouTube, I need to go see Jax, like ASAP. So I'm so glad we got Jax on this season. But we move on to the top nine, which is the Crystal Ball, another design challenge where there really isn't a booger of a look, which makes judging very difficult. I think this is another episode where, based on personal preference, you might think one thing is rigged or another thing is rigged, but nothing stood out to me as, like, riggery. Some people think Mistress should have won over Sasha. I think it was very close between the two, and I don't even know who I would pick between the two. It's not like Sasha was nowhere near Mistress's level or vice versa. They had very different packages, so it's somewhat hard to compare, but I would have been fine with either of them winning, and I don't think it was rigged that Sasha won. As for Spice being in the bottom, people also had an issue with this, but I didn't. Like, she was given very specific instructions from Rue and Carson in the workroom to, one, give them a different silhouette since much of what she had been wearing so far looked very similar, and two, to ditch that disco ball purse that she showed them. And she didn't do either of these things. Now, I really liked her racer girl look. That was one of my favorites of the category. But her ball look was nothing special. Again, it was very similar to other things we've seen from her. And her design look was a piece of fabric. Like, I did like the top that she made, but the whole bottom looked kind of lazy. But again, if there were some flops in this cast, like in this challenge, Spice could have been safe. But it really came down to those small little details that put people in the bottom here. Like, Selena looked absolutely stunning in her design look, but the fit was off a little bit, and that palm tree look was, I mean, let's be real, if any of her looks should have been the golden boot, it should have been this one. I loved her racer girl look too, but she also had enough issues, I think, to warrant a bottom placement. So, I don't think there's any rigor here. And what a shame that Spice kind of disappeared in the edit after Sugar went home and she refused to start drama by calling Aura out as the one who should have went home instead the episode after. I mean, she had this whole storyline set up after Sugar's departure and it went absolutely nowhere. Overall, I never had an issue with the twins being cast. I, I always knew it was going to be iconic television regardless, but it kind of feels like we got edged with this storyline. Sugar went home so soon, and then Spice's storyline went nowhere besides her saying, like, I'm gonna be in my top era, and then wasn't. I love the twins. I hope in a few years we get to see one of them or both of them come back because I think they're really good TV and a very different perspective on drag than we usually see on the show. Okay, so now let's talk about one of the most rigged episodes of the entire season based on all the tea that we've got from the queens since it aired. We have a lot to break down. So it is the 50-50 interview challenge where the queens have to sit down with celebrities and interview them. It's, it's a parody of 60 Minutes. And this challenge is interesting because the queens got to watch each other as they perform. So they know how they did. They got to form their own opinions. They don't just get to hear about what the judges thought. According to multiple queens at this point, everyone thought the top two of this episode was going to be Lucy and Selena and they thought Malaysia and Sasha were the weakest. Now, what we saw was Marsha, Selena, Malaysia, and Mistress really struggle, and Sasha, Lux, and Lucy slay it. Because this is a challenge where they obviously get more time than we got to see, like it gets condensed down for the final edit, I definitely trust the girls' opinions here more than just what we saw in the edit. We know how editing something a certain way can completely change the perspective of it. Now, when I was watching, I definitely thought this was Lux's win, and I was pretty surprised when Sasha won it. I also thought Marsha was for sure going to be in the bottom, and then was shocked when she was just safe. Especially when the runway is brought into it, Marsha had easily the weakest runway of the week, barely even attempting to recreate her Beyonce look that she chose. I mean, it really seemed like she just picked a dress that she already had and said, hey, this is sort of reminiscent of this Beyonce look, this works. We also got some tea that Mistress thought she was going to be in the bottom two in the lip sync, 
and she was wearing a gown and was like stressed that she wasn't going to be able to do much. So in retaliation, she told both the girls and production that if they put her in the bottom two, she was just going to stand there and do nothing, which was like basically pulling a Dovima. So I'm sure producers were living for the idea of a Malaysia and Mistress lip sync after their multi-episode story arc, but losing Mistress this soon was definitely off the table if she was just going to give up. Now, we don't know when Mistress said this, but my thought is she said this before her critiques when the girls were discussing, like, how they thought everyone did. If the sentiment was Mistress was probably gonna be bottom two, then it makes sense for her to start claiming that she would just throw it to Malaysia and then the producers are gonna have to scramble and then throw Selena in the bottom instead since she would likely send Malaysia home. And if not, I mean, producers didn't give a shit about Selena, so she would be an okay queen to sacrifice. Mistress really was television gold this season. It, it wouldn't be nearly as interesting without her. And something that I found so smart about Mistress is she's always making sure that she has a storyline going on. First with Irene, and then Irene goes home, then with the twins, and then Sugar goes home, so she amps up her story with Malaysia. And after they make up and Malaysia goes home, she amps up her story with Lucy. Having all of these stories going on ensures that producers aren't going to get rid of her. I mean, she's the only one causing any drama whatsoever on top of being a good competitor. Well, her and Lux. <laughs> Tag teaming, basically. It was very smart for Mistress to almost weaponize this to ensure her longevity in the competition. She truly is one of the best queens we have ever seen on this show when it comes to looks, when it comes to talent, when it comes to personality. And, I mean, I expect to be seeing a lot of her in the next few years. I mean, I could see her getting a WoW Plus show. I could see her being on all the tours, an all-stars run. Like, where she goes, entertainment follows. And that is a very important and crucial trait to have in this industry. This is one of those episodes where what we saw on our screens does not line up at all with what the queens claimed went down. So that's why I'm being a little more heavy-handed with my riggery claims and conspiracies here in response to that. But this is just what makes the most sense to me, kind of piecing together all of these little pieces. Now, as to why Sasha was given the win when the girls felt like she didn't do that great of a job, I really don't know. I mean, the other options were Lucy or Lux, and it's not like they were queens that producers didn't want to give wins to. So maybe they just really liked Sasha's performance more than the queens did. She did have that iconic moment of throwing her cards away, and maybe that was like a big thing that producers thought was going to be a moment. But regardless of how rigged it may or may not be, Selena and Malaysia lip sync to single ladies. I love this lip sync. I know some people hate it. I don't know why. It's fun. It's camp. Selena wins, rightfully so. And Malaysia, baby doll fox, unfortunately sashays away. As much as I love her, this did kind of feel like her time. And we go into the top seven with a very strong cast. I mean, this episode is the stand-up challenge, which, okay, then maybe this isn't the, the, this cast's strongest showing. But regardless, I don't think there was any rigory going on in this episode. Lux, Lucy, and Selena really slayed this challenge. Mistress kind of faded into the background. And Marsha, Sasha, and Anitra all struggled. A lot of people say this should have been Sasha's bottom placement episode, but looking at how many laughs she got compared to Marsha, it wasn't even close. Marsha got a lot of kind of like hesitant, like pity laughs with only one real legit laughter from the audience and the judges. But on the other hand, Sasha had seven like full complete laughs. I think Sasha was rightfully low and her runway also pushes her ahead of Marsha on top of that. So then we have... The lip sync heard around the world. Anitra versus Marsha to boss bitch. If you notice, I haven't spoken much about Marsha. And it's because the show also forgot that she was there. <laughs> she did have what seemed to be like a little rivalry with Spice. Specifically when Marsha thanks Lux for help with her makeup on the main stage, but doesn't thank Spice who also had helped her. And then Spice calls this out like in front of the judges and says, like, Marsha should be thanking her as well. And it was kind of a moment, but it just didn't make the cut. But, like, that's a potential storyline for Marsha, comparing and contrasting her and Spice, since they are both younger and newer queens, but have very different aesthetics and approaches to drag. She also had a pretty major fight with Selena in Untucked during the Girl Groups episode that was cut that many girls have mentioned at this point. So my guess is that 
the show wanted to cut some of Marsha's shadier moments in order to make her more of a likable heroine. But then the problem is that she's not left with much other content in the episodes. So a lot of people wanted this lip sync with Marsha and Anitra to be a double Shantae. By the sound of it, even Michelle Visage, who says this is her favorite lip sync of all time, wanted this to be a double Shantae. I would have been fine with a double save. I mean, I don't think it's rigged that Marsha went home either. Anitra definitely won that lip sync, and it would have been nice to see Marsha get another shot, especially since the next episode was the Rusical, but that's probably exactly why they didn't use a double save, because Marsha was not someone production was pushing or necessarily saw in the top four, so her leaving around seventh is probably the farthest they were going to allow her to go. Next up is the Rusical, Wig Loose, and I mean, like, this should have been a top two episode. Like, the first Daytona wins in season 14, just do a top two and give everyone else some good critiques and let's move on because nobody did a bad job or even a, a semi-bad job. And, you know, even factoring in the runway, I don't think there was any bad runways either. All six of them killed it and it was kind of a cop-out that the bottom two was just determined from who the girls said should go home when RuPaul asked them on the runway. So Selena and Lucy lip sync to Running Up That Hill. I'm so happy we got this as a lip sync song. But I think about how iconic it could have been as the top two lip sync between like Sasha and Anitra instead. But we lose Selena, who was my favorite on the season alongside Sasha, and we move on to the makeovers. Another episode where I don't think there's any riggery. Now, so Lucy goes home here. It's the end of her season long saga. And yeah, I mean, watch that Lucy video if you want the deep dive on that. It feels very fitting that it was Lux who sent her home since they'd been kind of at each other's throats since the third episode when they were both vying for second place in the commercial challenge. It's a nice wrap up to that arc and a good moment for Lux who got to eat up a lip sync right before the finale, which is always good. Lux was last in almost every poll for who the audience wanted to win and she caught a lot of flack from the fandom for her confidence. But something I loved about Lux is that she was confident but never delusional. When she did poorly, she admitted it. And she never, like, didn't back up her cockiness. Like, when Mistress asks her if she thinks she can beat Lucy in a lip sync, she says, I know that I can. And then she went out and fucking did. Her cockiness isn't unwarranted, and I wish people were easier on her. I mean, she's young, she's so full of talent, and in this industry, confidence is everything, if you have the talent to back it up, which Lux does. I think Lux is going to be a gigantic star of this franchise, and honestly, I think she deserves it. The next episode is the Rumix, where we see Anitra and Mistress in the bottom two, lip sync for their spot in the finale. Now, after this episode tells us that there's just going to be a top three, they decide to do a top four anyways, which just kind of makes this episode a little anticlimactic. And if they had done a top two at the Rusical instead, or even saved Marsha in Boss Bitch, then we have a top five here that can go down to a top four, and I feel like that works a lot better. RuPaul says in this episode that she wanted to make sure that someone went home every week. Like, the fandom had a gun to her head, basically, after season 14. But really, I mean, all we want is the eliminations to make sense. We don't mind a non-elimination or a double save if they feel warranted. But season 14's issue is that there were so many twists and turns that felt so conflated and it caused a lot of people to get worn out of the season. Here, people were basically begging for a non-elimination episode just to shake things up a little bit. But just like Goldilocks, season 14 was too much, season 15 was too little, hopefully season 16 gets it just right. Then we are at the finale, which I also don't think was rigged in the slightest. Lux's performance was solid, but it felt a little small, and in a song all about giving fashion, I wish she'd worn something a little more fashionable, <laughs> maybe a little more intricate and, and high concept. And then Mistress had a hilarious song, an amazing costume, but her face just felt a little disconnected from the performance. Anitra and Sasha, I think both did an amazing job. Sasha annihilated this entire finale, from the performance to the final lip sync to the looks. And I feel like we are just living in the best timeline with Sasha Colby as our Drag Race winner and soon to be all winners to winner. 
While I do think the season does somewhat struggle with the predictability of her win being like seen from miles away, getting to watch her slay the entire competition, the runways, the confessionals, I mean, it was a joy to watch and genuinely kept me engaged with the season the entire time, just getting to watch Sasha's journey. Sasha is talent that we rarely see on this show. I mean, I'm so excited to see what she does with her reign. And I think that she can reach new heights we haven't seen a Rue girl reach before. I mean, the world is her oyster, and I hope that she takes full advantage of that. Overall, while I do think this season has some rigged moments, the top four is the top four in all universes. Every timeline leads to this top four, I truly feel. I don't think that changes no matter what you tweak. I do have many more thoughts on this season, but I'm going to keep them for my review video coming out next week. And also next week, we will have how it would have gone if it was unrigged. So we'll see how much actually changes from that. Uh, but something that was weird about this season is there were a lot of episodes that weren't rigged at all. But the ones that were, were like insane. Like my charts are either all green or all red. I feel like there's no in between. So I think maybe that's why it feels like there's not as much riggery because it's not like spread throughout the entire season. It's just confined to a couple certain episodes. So I actually am interested to see like how much really does change when we fix those episodes. So catch that video next week along with my review video. Oh, we are we are full in the season 15 swing and All Stars 8 is about to start. So we are like we're in maximum overdrive on this channel, but I'm here for it and I'm living. If you have not, check out the rigged recap for this finale episode. It's coming out, if not today, like the next day. It is me and Butsy, and you know when the two of us are in a room, we're just hateful idiots. <laughs> and this episode is no different. And the rigged recap will be officially returning for All Stars 8. So comment below who you would want to see as guests for that. If you are not already, make sure that you subscribe. We are very close to 60K, and I'm going to officially announce for 75K, whenever I reach 75K, I will do a full drag transformation video. So if you want to see that happen, make sure you are subscribed. Comment below also what you think the most rigged moment of the entire season is. And thank you guys so much for being patient with this video. I know it came out a couple days later than I said, but honestly, I just kept finding more stuff I wanted to add and tweak, and I wanted to make sure it was as good as possible. So apologies for that, but I think you'd rather it be a perfect video than an okay video out on time. Here are the links to all of my social medias, and thank you guys so much for watching. I will catch you all in the next one.